When you visit Jerusalem, you will see if you go to the city of David, the archaeological park, these containers, pithos, singular, pithoi, plural. So you see a few of these containers. They contained oil or grain. And archaeologists tell us that this is where Nebuchadnezzar entered the city during his large last siege of Jerusalem in 586 and he destroyed the city. They've excavated this. You know, when I look at this, I, I feel so sad. Ezekiel and the prophet uh, Jeremiah warned Zedekiah not to resist the Babylonians. He ignored it. And, and this is the result. You would have seen a beautiful city as it was built previously, but today it's only ruins. Now, this was God's ideal for, the, for his people, not to have a, a lot of ruins around them. This was in 586, but I want to tell you the 597 siege. The city was not destroyed, so let's read about it. In the days of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. That's the king rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar. What do you think is going to happen if you rebel against your overlord? And the Lord sent against him, that's Jehoiakim, raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the people of Ammon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Surely, at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also because of the innocent blood that he had shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. He paid with his life for his disobedience. Then Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come out of his land any more, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Became mighty. Now listen what the Bible says about Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king still a youngster, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Natan of Jerusalem. And then these words, sad words, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. Parents, if you walk wickedly, your sons or your daughters may follow you. It is so important for parents to live a godly life. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem. And the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. Now, according to the Babylonian chronicle, Nebuchadnezzar began his second campaign against Judah in the month of Kislev. December, January, 598, 597. Can you remember the date of his first siege when he took Daniel as an exile? 605. How would the young king react when he saw the army surrounding Jerusalem? Then Jehoiakim of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, 
And the officers went out to the king of Babylon, the right thing to do. And the king of Babylon, in the eighth year of his reign, took him prisoner. Jeremiah said to the following king, don't fight them. Just surrender and save the city. Fortunately, this young man listened to Jeremiah and he surrendered. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. Isn't this a sad account? Some of the vessels of the temple had already been taken to Babylon during the 605 siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. That was his first attack. No doubt the most valuable vessels that remained after the initial looting were now also carried away. Some vessels were still allowed to stay in Jerusalem. We read about them a little later. And he also carried into captivity all Jerusalem, all the captains and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths, none remained except the poorest people of the land. What a sad story. Disobedience is too costly to pay. The skilled workers would provide Nebuchadnezzar with valuable helpers for his own extensive building enterprises. They were trained to build. And he carried Jehoiakim captive to Babylon. This is what the Bible says. We're going to see what archaeology says. The king's mother, the king's wives. So this young man had more than one wife. Bad news. His officers and the mighty of the land he carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. All the valiant men, 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, and 1,000, all were strong and fit for war. These the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. Then the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Joachim's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. He was involved with the Judeans quite often. Now, would this new king be careful to obey God and save the city from destruction? Sometimes sin transcends all logic. He didn't obey God. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. What a sad story. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out from his presence. Pay the price. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Oh, what a mistake. You don't rebel against the mighty king Babylon, the mighty king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. What a heartbreaking moment in the history of God's people. Does this happen to you? Are we disobedient? Who else was taken into captivity in 597? This is fascinating. The prophet Ezekiel was among those carried away into Babylon. The years of his book are counted from the time of Jehoiakim's captivity. Have you ever read the book of Ezekiel? Fascinating book. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. 
visions of God in captivity. You know, sometimes we're in captivity because of our sins. But God wants to reveal himself in our captivity. What a God. It happened to Ezekiel. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans. And there it gives you the location, by the river Kebar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. The hand of the Lord was on the exiles. He's a God of love. He wants us to repent and enjoy freedom. The ruins of the city of David tell us that Judah went into exile. Why? Because of the way they treated the poor. You know, the greatest sin in the eyes of God is the way we are treating the underdog, the poor, the desolate. It's his property. And if you're guilty, change your attitude. And be kind to the weak people of life, the outcasts. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Sila, defend the poor and fatherless. To justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. You know, we're not talking here only about monetary desolation. There are people that's poor, encouraged, depressed. God wants us to care for these people. You know, inhumanity to man is our greatest sin. Listen to what the prophet Ezekiel writes. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds, of Israel, the ministers, the men of cloth of those days, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? Do we still have shepherds like the shepherds of those days in Jerusalem? Of course. And if you're a pastor, think of this verse. And ask God to help you not to persecute the flock and take care. Take care of them, please. Ye eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak and healed the sick or bound up the injured. Here we have sounds, echoes of what Jesus says in Matthew 25. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. Ah, I see so many cases where pastors, maybe you've read it abused the congregation. This is besides the multitude of other horrific crimes they committed. How important it is to obey God's golden rules, the Ten Commandments. Loretta, what agreement did the Lord make here at Sinai with the ancient slaves, the nation of Israel? They were slaves. He rescued them. What could happen if they obey the Ten Commandments? Prosperity. Golden rules. And if they disobey, man, you pay a price even today if you disobey. God wants us to be obedient. This is the way we show our love to him. If you love me, keep my commandments. Ten golden rules. Love me, and obey me, he says. Message of the first four commandments. Respect to God. 
worship him. What was Israel's greatest sin? The way they treated the unfortunate ones among them. We can be so cruel. The last six, the way we treat people. A beautiful balanced law code, the best ever written. Read it, cherish it, practice it. How little do we enter into sympathy with Christ on that which should be the strongest bond of union between us and him? Compassion for depraved, guilty, suffering souls, dead in trespasses and sins. The inhumanity of man toward man is our greatest sin. Please develop a compassion for people around you. Lonely faces, lonely people, they just need a little love. Give it to them. This is what God wants us to do. This is why these mighty empires went down. They neglected those who needed their love and compassion. Ancient rooms of the gate, courtroom of Sodom, where Lot served as a judge. Do you remember why Sodom was destroyed? But was there another equally heinous sin in Sodom? Listen to what Ezekiel says. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Now that did she strengthen the hand of the poor needy. She did not look after the poor and needy. The NIV says, did not help the poor and needy. If you see a need of a fellow human being, please help him by neglecting them. It is as great a sin as the sins committed in Sodom. The Babylonian Chronicle confirms the 597 siege of Jerusalem as recorded in the Bible. I've got so much respect for the signs of archaeology confirming the story of the Bible. In the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar, in the month Chislev, November, December, the king of Babylon assembled his army and after he had invaded the land of Hatti, that is Syria, Palestine, he laid siege to the city of Judah. This is what the Bible says. This is what archaeology tells us. On the second day of the month of Adar, March 16, he conquered the city and took the king, Jeconiah, Prisoner, he installed in his place a king, Zedekiah, of his own choice, and after he had received rich tribute, he sent forth to Babylon. Archaeology confirms the Bible. You can believe the Bible. Even if you've sinned, the Bible says you can be forgiven. <laughs> These containers tell us when Nebuchadnezzar entered Jerusalem, as I said in the beginning, he did not wait for the rebellion by King Jehoiakim to take on greater proportions. He had to step in. I'm sure Daniel watched the mighty Babylonian army as they went on their way to quench the rebellion. I think he cried when he saw this. Oh, my people, why are you so rebellious? Why have you rejected God's commandments? I can almost hear him pray for his wicked fellow Israelites that the Lord would save them and bring them to their senses. Here you see the clay tablet telling us what the Bible tells us. Because of his important role in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, it will be good to learn a little of this exceptional prophet, the prophet Daniel. 605, the first siege of Babylon. 597, the second siege of Jerusalem. Amount of exiles, 10,000. Name of a prophet that was also exiled, Ezekiel. 
And as I said, because of this important role in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, it will be good to learn a little of this exceptional prophet, Ezekiel, means God will strengthen. A priest, the son of Buzi, born in Judah, but transported to Babylonia with the group that went into captivity with Jehoiakim in 597. He was placed in a different part of the land. He was with a group of Jews who settled at Tel Abib by the river of Kebar, an irrigation canal known from cuneiform records as Narkabari, which passed the city of Nippur. This is interesting. Archaeological evidence testifies to a large Jewish settlement in the vicinity during the time of the Babylonian captivity. And I was so excited when I discovered this. Now look, look at this, this map. I took this from the Bible Museum in Jerusalem. Can you read Keba River down here? And then follow the dots. Now where do they pass? They pass Nippur. This is interesting. They passed Nippur. To which city does Kebar flow? Nippur. To which place was the exiles placed? Nippur. There you've got the clay tablet. But they made tremendous discoveries just recently. Kebar River. You know the Bible speaks of the Kebar River. Here yeah, you read it on a clay tablet. The Bible is true. What else should we know about Ezekiel? Was happily married, but his wife died about nine years after their captivity began. He seems to have had a house of his own in the fifth year of his captivity. He was called to the prophetic office and served in this capacity for some 22 years, from about 593 to 571 BC. At a time when the temple lay in ruins, and the people were in exile, it was particularly appropriate that the offices of priest and prophet should be united in one person. Jeremiah, whose ministry was in part contemporary with that of Ezekiel, was likewise, was likewise a priest prophet, as was Zechariah. Isn't this wonderful? Priest prophet, priest prophet types of another priest, prophet Jesus. In a special sense, Ezekiel was God's messenger to the Jews in captivity, as Jeremiah was to the Jews who remained in Judah and Jerusalem, and as Daniel was to Nebuchadnezzar and the court at Babylon. You know, God always had prophets to reprimand and comfort his children. Please read the Bible. He is reprimanding you when you read it. But he also comforts you as you read it. Can we expect the coming of an end time prophet? This is another subject. Here you see another map of the Kabaru Kebar Canal, which was part of a network of canals at Nippur. Come with me to the real site in the south of Iraq. Ekur means a, a temple situation. You're looking at it. When Ezekiel and the 10,000 exiles came here, and you can see the dilapidated Zikharut was much higher. Erosion brought it down and wars brought it down. Ekur refers to the temples on top there. There were many temples. By the way, Nippur was more than just an ordinary city. It was a city of religion where a god was worshipped. Naramson, Nebuchadnezzar's role model, built the foundations of the temples, as I mentioned in a previous lecture. The brick structure on top was constructed by American archaeologists around 1900. Let's walk up the structure. You know, it is so exciting visiting these sites with its biblical uh, uh, connotations. Here we recorded the history of Ezekiel who lived here. 
Now this recording will be available soon on social media. Let me give you some of the history of this religious ancient site. Nippur was one of the longest lived sites beginning in the prehistoric Ubaite period, 5000 BC, and lasting till about 800 AD in the Islamic era, according to Gibson. More than 30,000 cuneiform tablets of extraordinary literally, literally, historical, grammatically, and economic importance. 30,000, and not all of them have been translated. There await us some more revelations. More than 80% of all known Sumerian literary compositions have been found here at Nippur. You're looking at the site where they found it. Included were the earliest recognized versions of the flood story, parts of the Gilgamesh epic, and dozens of other compositions like the Enuma Elish, the creation story. That's on the clay tablets. It reveals what the Bible tells us. Daniel testified to his faith in the Babylonian court where they worship Marduk. Ezekiel testified for his faith in Nippur where they worship Enlil. God wants his people of the world to learn of his saving grace. That's why you've got Jeremiah, you've got Daniel, you've got Ezekiel. Prophets are God's mouthpieces. How highly was Enlil regarded? Look at these gods in the Iraqi museum, big guys. But we've get, we get valuable information from them. Enlil's commands are by far the loftiest. His words are holy. His utterances are immutable. The fate he decides is everlasting. His glance makes the mountains anxious. anxious. All the gods of the earth bow down to Father Enlil. Now remember, I think this was part of Nebuchadnezzar to evangelize his people who worshipped at Enlil, at Nippur. Ezekiel had to tell them of his God who excels all other gods, including Enlil, which they thought was supreme. The Sumerian words read, When you mapped out the holy settlement on the earth, you built the city of Nippur by yourself, Enlil. This was a mighty, influential religious site. And God sent 10,000 exiles plus a prophet to mix with them. In the last chapters of his book, Ezekiel writes about the Edenic situation where God wants to take his people, a place without pain, a place without sickness. Are you sick? A place without death. He could share this with the worshippers of Enlil. And one day in heaven, I want to meet some of these people. By God's leading, Ezekiel came to this very site where Enlil was venerated as one of the supreme deities. And in my, my imagination, I see him mingling with these people. The name of Ezekiel's loving God who transcends all other gods echoes from these runes to our day. Runes tell a story. Right here a voice spoke to Ezekiel telling of the imminent 586 destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. Can you imagine his pain when God revealed to Ezekiel that Jerusalem will be flattened as well as the temple? Daniel had pain, thinking of the misfortune of his people. Do you have pain when you hear of the misfortune of your people? And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, 
Set your face toward Jerusalem. Preach against the holy places and prophesy against the land of Israel. He wanted them to convert. And say to the land of Israel, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath and cut off both righteous and wicked from you. You know, when I sin, I hurt innocent people. Don't sin. Who else warned Israel of the consequences of disobedience? Moses, Joshua, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. How does disobedience like crime, theft, and adultery make us cruel to other people? You know, when you cherish sin, you don't care about people. If you want to divorce your wife for another wife, you are killing her emotionally, but you don't care because sin makes you ineffective, emotionless. If there's sin in your life, ask God to give you the victory. Let's return to the ruins of the city of David and listen to the story of the last rebel king in the sad history of Judah. He rejected the advice of the prophet Jeremiah of the prophet Ezekiel, I suppose Daniel also warned him to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't listen. And look at this. The city was destroyed and burned with fire. And here you can pick up some bulas. Archaeologists found some names of the people mentioned in the Bible who died during the destruction of the city. 586. You know, God mentions insignificant people to tell you that the Bible is true. Insignificant names mentioned in the Bible here, they've discovered the bull are the names of these people. The Bible is such a marvelous book. Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. And they built a siege wall against it all around. And still Zedekiah didn't go out and surrender. They saw the end was coming. Sin makes us stupid. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. They had lots of time to surrender. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. This is what sin looks like. He burned the house of the Lord. Can you see that beautiful temple? God was the architect of that temple. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house. All the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Was there a, a I told you so, in the heart of Jeremiah, in the heart of Ezekiel, in the heart of God? No. Tears. They pled with the wicked Judeans. And when the tragedy struck, they wept. This is the God we serve. Here you see one of the uh, machines of those days pushing against the wall till the wall breaks. Just before the destruction of Jerusalem, while the battering rams were pounding the Jerusalem walls, Jeremiah bought, bought a piece of land. Can you imagine this? They were destroyed. Why did he buy a piece of land? He remembered the prophecy of a God of love, of the restoration of the nation. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years, 
I completed that Babylon. I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. Jeremiah bought land to show the people that God is going to restore them. What love for rebels. Oh. For I know the thoughts I think of, I think toward you, you rebels. I know the thoughts I have, and he's telling it to you and me. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and hope. I'll bring you back to Jerusalem if you, if you want to. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. My friend, you can make the biggest mess of your life. You look up to God and say, I'm sorry. He restores you and he brings you back to the Jerusalem of his happiness. Looking down from the ruined Zikharut at Nippur, at the vast area of more rooms, I was reminded of Ezekiel's comforting words. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you've ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every hill, high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. I've read this before, but I wanted to read it again. Therefore, O shepherds, pastors, ministers, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. If you're a pastor, he's going to require the flock from your hand. Be kind to your parishioners. Don't abuse them. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from the, their mouths, and that, that they may no longer be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep, and seek them out, as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will feed them in good pasture. Do you get the message here? If your pastor disappointed you, God says, I will be your shepherd. I will feed them in good pasture. He will feed us, not the pastor. And their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. They shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost 
and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Question. Are you disappointed in your pastor? Don't become bitter. Don't leave your church. Jesus offers his loving kindness as a marvelous shepherd to you. And he will never disappoint you. You're looking at clay tablets, which bears the names of the exiles. You know, we read in the Bible that they were exiled to Babylon, but no evidence yet. Recently, they discovered these clay tablets. You're looking, my dear friend, at the name of some of the exiles. Their spiritual leaders were partly responsible for their exile. Their new neighbors asked them about singing a song. Please sing us a song to the names of the people on these clay tablets. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Here we wept when we remembered Zion, they longed for Jerusalem. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. Have you been carried away to a foreign land of pain and rejection and dis disgust and disgusting emotions? Are you crying and longing for the happy days you've enjoyed in the past, maybe with better pastors, better situations. Where is your harp with which you sang praises to God? We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. Their songs ended in exile. Maybe your songs ended in your present exile. For there those carried us away captive, asked us for a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And these songs are so beautiful. You can read it in Psalms 115, 16, 17, 18, 19. Beautiful songs of Zion. Precious. Tell me, are there people who want you to sing the songs of Zion? Sing about the goodness of God in spite of your position. Why are you silent? Why don't you praise God even if you're an exile into pain, sickness, death and guilt? God wants you to sing of his love. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land, they said. Are you asking the same question? My dear friend, if we have stopped singing because of pain, I've got good news for you. These clay tablets Tell the story of exiles who wiped their tears and began singing again. Listen to the lyrics. They found portions of the lamentations at cave number four at Qumran. Listen to the beautiful lyrics. This I recall to my mind. This is Jeremiah writing. Therefore I have hope. What did Jeremiah recall? My fellow traveler, through the valley of pain, rejection and misunderstanding, we are still alive, it says. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have, I have hope. What did he recall? He was still alive. There is hope for us. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassion fail not. I don't know what mess you've made in life. How many lives you've broken, broke. 
through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. As long as you live, there is hope. God just wants you to say, I'm sorry. When will he reveal his kindness, his mercies? They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah looks at the ruins of the city. It's nothing. He writes this lamentations and he says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. The soul who seeks him. I once had a phone call from a psychologist. Man, I've never seen a depressed man like him. I said, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a theologian. He says, I went through the directory and I, I, I stopped at your name. <laughs> How can I help a psychologist who's supposed to help me? I gave him homework. I said, well, I can give advice. You can either reject it or try it. I said to him, when you wake up in the morning, say these words. Thank you, Lord. Two words. He had a cynical expression in his face. I said goodbye to him and he left. I said, if you do this for seven days, come back and let's talk again. He did come back. The first morning he woke up. Thank you, Lord. But he had nothing to thank the Lord for. The second morning he repeated the words. Thank you, Lord. He was telling this to me. The third day, he woke up. Thank you, Lord. The fourth day. You know, when you express something positive, it does something to the frontal lobes. He was friendly. He said, thank you, Lord. The fifth day. He woke up. Thank you, Lord. And he wept. And he came to me. A healed psychologist. If you are depressed, when you open your eyes in the morning, just say, Thank you, Lord. You've got so much to be thankful for. Father in heaven, thank you for being the friend of exiles. Thank you for caring for us in the valleys of depression, regrets, pain, sickness. Help us to look up and say thank you, Lord, so that we can be healed. In Jesus' name, Amen.